now. Thank you. So hello everybody, nice to meet you all. Uh, this is our fourth episode of Patient Safety Webinar. This episode been going on for the last year or so during the COVID crisis. Today is a special day because it's a joint educational program between the IMA UK and the IMU. My name is Ali Nakash. I am the Vice President of the IMA UK. And this theme of this webinar is very interesting. It's about minimal access and robotic surgery in gynecology and gyne-oncology. So I would like now to hand over the, the microphone to the President, Ahmed Sudani of the IMU. Dr. Ahmed Sudani, can you just, can you just do a small introduction? Thank you very much, Prof. Ali, for this uh, wonderful introduction. And thank you all, uh, particularly for our speakers. And I also see Professor Mundaridouri with us. He is a professor of vascular surgery, uh, but he attend all our meetings and welcome uh, Mundar. Mm -hmm. And I also, our friends from USA, Namir Costa is there. He's a physician. I don't know what he's doing at Gandhi College meeting. Hi, Namir. Anyway, you welcome all, and thank you very much. Uh, as Ali said, uh, these meetings are run jointly uh, between IMA and IMU, and we're proud of that because we work closely for uh, purpose of education and combined effort in all these. Uh, I know some of you, but I will lately introduce my friend, Professor very calm from the USA who will talk about a subject which is of interest to me because I don't understand anything of it is the ovarian cancer. So welcome to this meeting and uh, I'm sure we're going to have a very nice evening. And thank you very much, Prof. Ali, to you. Thank you, uh, President Mohammed Sudani. Nice to, for you to be here and we are honored for, for that really. So I'm coming now to the, uh, our first speaker, Reza. Amir Riza is no strange to Iraq. He was in Najaf more than 10 years ago, a part of a group of British uh, consultant gynecologists. He ran workshop, operated at that time, and since that time, he carried on with his career. I would say remarkable career. I can tell you a few things about this gentleman. He's a consultant gynecologist and minimal access surgeon in one of the prestigious places in London, West London, called Chelsea Westminster Hospital. This is a center of excellence, one of the few center of excellence in London. He's the lead consultant for an accredited endometriosis center and also the founder of this center called International Center for Endometriosis. He's a founder of Chelsea Center for Minimal Access Surgery. He provides a range of national and international courses, both in the UK and abroad. He's also the new clinical director of his department for Chelsea, uh, Chel West Trust. In fact, he's my boss. We work in the same place. Uh, Mr. Riza is a leading on a number of research projects, aiding at the diagnosis of endometriosis, inflammatory markers, along with safety in laparoscopic surgery. Mr. Riza has de developed his interest in robotic surgery and now is he is one of the few surgeons in UK uh, providing this fully funky advanced robotic surgery for complex deep endometriosis surgery. So, Mr. Guza, we are blessed to have you with us. Can you have the platform for you? Thank you. Thank you very much, Ali. That was a very generous introduction. Thank you very much for those kind words. I don't know if I'm, I'm able to have those words, but thank you. Very kind of you. And thank you everyone on this forum as well. Um, all very senior and distinguished guests and friends as well. Uh, thank you to IMA for inviting me as well, to give me an opportunity to come and talk to all of you. Uh, uh, as Ali said, uh, uh, I am part of a number of courses in a number of countries, so it's always a pleasure to come, and I remember that moment very well when I came to Karbala and Najaf and did the laparoscopic course as well for a couple of days and operated on some cases. Um, I, I hope and wish that, again, those days come when we can come and work with our Iraqi brothers and colleagues and, and work there in those cities. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Ali gave me a very 
challenging topic, the robotics in, in, in UK. And I thought, oh my goodness, what I'm going to talk about it because yes, I can talk a lot about robotics. I was trying to link up, how can I link up with, with Iraqi health? Now you people are absolutely expert in Iraqi health system and where you are in terms of minimal excess surgery as robotic surgery is simply the offshoot of minimal excess surgery. So, so I'm sure when the questions come and the time come, you all will update me that how the minimal excess surgery is. Let me share my presentation before I carried away in talking. Uh, so just let me share it. I hope it goes fine. Here we go. That's fine. We, uh, uh, okay, that's, that's, you all have to now hold me. That's the call I was not expecting is from the hospital, uh, from a labor ward. Just give me a second. You have to apologize, give me apology. It's nice and clear, absolutely. My apology, it was from the hospital. I needed to take it. Okay, so I think you all can hear me now. So, but I will try to link up with, with our expertise, what we have um, and what we do in terms of laparoscopic surgery. Um, teaching and training is very close to my heart. Uh, in London, we do courses almost every week in minimal access surgery. Uh, either it's a total laparoscopic hysterectomy courses, endometriosis, laparoscopic suturing courses, and we do live operating. So it's a quite a busy hospital we have in Chelsea. Um, uh, you may have heard the name, Ali talked about it. Me and Ali are colleagues actually. Uh, Chelsea Westminster and, 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 and West Middlesex Hospital are, are next to each other. So this is the hospital. I, if, I'm, I'm sure most of you, I'm sure, have been to London. Uh, that's Chelsea and Westminster Hospital. We're on the same road. We're Royal Brompton and Royal Marston Hospital, one of the oldest cardiology and the cancer hospital in the world, actually, uh, are there as well. And we are not very far, if you look from the... Uh, Palace of Westminster and Buckingham Palace. So we're right in the middle of uh, London, actually. And that's that's my hospital where I work. It's in a very congested central London area. So it's so a very busy place to come to. And if you come into the hospital, this is our outpatient area. That's where I do my outpatient hysteroscopy clinic. And it's a very nice hospital built by somebody who used to build ships, actually. So as you come in, it gives you a very good feeling. And even we have a 60 uh, chair um, cinema as well in the hospital. So you can come and watch movies and every movie which comes into Hollywood actually screens in Chelsea Hospital as well. So it's a very interesting place to work and we're very privileged, privileged to be in this hospital. Now, obviously, uh, the topic today is about talking about robotics now. In my next 20 minutes, I will take you through a few concepts, especially in gynecological perspective, that what is the history of gynecology in UK and challenges in evolution, the perspective of laparoscopic surgery, and then time for change, how things are changing. Why robotics? Is this a game changer or maybe just nothing, just simply continuation of everything? Joint venture between a Mr. Surgeon and Mr. Robot, and let's see how can they work together. And, and, and then let's talk about robots. So I'll take you through some of the robotic things and concepts about robotics, and then we'll put some theory into practice as well. I will bring in some of the videos, how we operate and what I did, and I'm sure some of you possibly will be operating already on robotic surgery or part of those teams. Uh, but I will take you through what we do here in London and then just a little bit of a window to look into the future, how the future will look. If you look through those things and the gynecological history, which some of you may well be aware as well, as a human, we endeavor to challenge the present. It's just in our nature. Whatever you are doing, either as a gynecologist, as a medical specialist, or whichever specialty we are, we're trying to do better. We're trying to challenge ourselves. And, 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 and if I think about myself as a gynecologist being in the gynecology meeting, I think my challenge will be that my patient go, um, gets an operation with no harm. That's the key, no harm. Two, there is no intraoperative, postoperative complication. Three, she gets back to work quickly and her problem are either cured or get better. So that endeavor and that baseline actually is the one which pushes us to do better, which pushes us to do research and education and learning. And this process obviously goes on. And as this meeting is part of that thing as well. 
as a gynecologist, we are very, very close to abdominal surgery and vaginal surgery. All of us, when we were trainees, we started simply for a cesarean section, which is a laparotomy. And we all start learning from that in our specialty, a very common operation. And vaginal surgery straight away going to episiotomy, then had a hernia repairs and prolapses. So abdominal surgery and vaginal surgery have been very close to us in gynecology. And then obviously, as things changed, we went towards laparoscopic surgery. Mm -hmm. And we all know that Harry Rack did his first laparoscopic hysterectomy in 1988. Actually, if you look at it then and go through the laparoscopic history from Kim Syme mm -hmm. in Germany all the way to Harry Reich, so gynecologists have been the one who actually have took initiative and took the challenge and brought the new concepts in number of surgical disciplines, actually. So even, even last week, we were talking about a nose technique uh, of a bowel resection nostomosis, which is, which is being introduced by, by Angioni from Italy, actually. So uh, he's a gynecologist. So gynecology absolutely has been at the forefront of many changes and innovations in surgery as well. And then obviously come the robotic and V nodes, which is a natural orifice uh, uh, operations for hysterectomy. And then I will talk about trends in UK and what the complications, mm -hmm. challenges we had in total laparoscopic hysterectomy me, which pushed us toward the robotic hysterectomy. If you look at the UK landscape in 2005, and absolutely you can contemplate it, what's happening in Iraq, for example, in your case now, in 2005, only 1.5% of hysterectomies were, by, were done laparoscopically with the keyhole surgery as compared to 11% in UK. And then came a time, 2009 and 10, <clears throat> All of a sudden, there was a huge explosion of laparoscopic learning and laparoscopic education through the Royal College, through the British Society of Gynecological Endoscopy, and number of things changed that this laparoscopy started to change its avenue, and more and more people started to doing it. And the other thing which happened in 2009 and 10, <clears throat> the consultants thought that endometriosis, which is absolutely one of the very common problem in 10 to 15% of our young population, that they need to be treated in accredited centers. Not everybody should be treating on endometriosis. And that also pushed people towards learning more advanced laparoscopy. So this one picture tells us how the attitudes change in UK, and I'm trying to stick to my topic, uh, the root of hysterectomy. And if you look at this audit, which was done 2011 to 17, if you look at 2011, this green actually shows laparoscopic surgery, and red is about abdominal hysterectomy, as the hysterectomy we were talking about. So hysterectomy rate laparoscopically went from 20% all the way to 40% above, and the abdominal route went down. So what happened now, as the training is expanded, as the, as the facilities are being available in the hospital becoming common, we can see the laparoscopic hysterectomy rate is <clears throat> just going up. But the surprising thing you will note here, that as the laparoscopic surgery going up, hysterectomy rate, abdominal hysterectomy coming down, vaginal route is just almost stable, slightly bit low, but almost stable. Because we know now, that people who are having vaginal hysterectomy, they have something like prolapse going on, stress incontinence, they're doing some other kind of vaginal repair procedure. And we also know right. from nice guidance and other guidance that mm -hmm. vaginal approach is a very safe approach. Most people are very expert in doing vaginal surgery. Obviously, I will come to the challenges in a second as well. So vaginal mm -hmm. surgical hysterectomy route remained almost constant, remained almost stable. But the abdominal route severely then we saw that it's coming down and most people are doing slowly, slowly bigger and bigger uteruses and doing more laparoscopic approach. So that was definitely a big trend. And that last study was in 2017. This was published in 2018-19. So we had a COVID gap here now, but obviously laparoscopic numbers have gone significantly up. Now sticking to the topic again, we're talking about robots here. And what you have in front of you, and it's surprising for me as well uh, to hear that, that it's with Leonardo da Vinci actually in 1495 talked about robots in his sketches. And his robot was nothing. But uh -huh. if you look at it, there are some pulleys and some strings 
and they move. So he actually gifted it to some center in Italy, where by moving these pulleys, this robot, which is robot basically, a knight, moves his hand, moves his necks and everything. So actually he made something exactly. But, and if you look at the most recent XI robot, if we just unpiece those technology and look inside the machine, it's nothing but pulleys and strings. So really we can say that, that again, Leonardo da Vinci has taken a, to, to taken a lead on this thing. We all in surgery and surgical field have gone through a massive change over the last 40 and 50 years. <laughs> We take ourselves back to 1850. It was about antiseptic surgery and imaging. Yeah, it was too early. If if you go back to surgeries in Scotland, the first hysterectomy almost was done 1860, 1870, and the mortality rate was huge because of yes, infection. But as we learned about antiseptic technique, that became the main thing. And again, you'll be surprised that 1950, 1980, minimal invasive surgery already started. And it doesn't mean it's about gynecology, it's about ophthalmology, angioplasty, a lot of specialties came in. And robotic surgery actually was introduced in 1990, 2000 and became more common as we, as, as, as we stand now in robotic microsurgery and things are changing. And I just brought a few examples that I will come back to Da Vinci Robotic and Gynecology in a second, that there are, there are about 15 different kind, even more actually, different kind of robotic systems being used by other specialities in a very expert manner. If you look at Stryker, for example, wonderful for orthopedics for hip and knee replacement. If you look Medtronic here, in the spine, they have to put small nails in them and then they, they, they impose the MRI image on the spine and they can insert these nails in extreme precision and it which takes the human hand shake away. And, and that's been used for some time. And if you look at the laser knife, cyber knife, which is for the cancers, non-invasive surgery actually is a very good thing as well, which is being used. So just three examples here, but the main point I'm trying to say is that Robotic surgery is nothing new, it's going on for a long period of time. Multiple specialties have adopted different types of mechanized system, which were effective for them as well. Now, if we come to us then in gynecology, our Da Vinci report in our hand, and now there are so many other reports as well. It's not only Da Vinci, it's a Hugo, it's CRM, it's, it's a lot of other robotic system has come in the market as well. But if you pick up the Da Vinci, which came first and became obviously the most commonest one, I would say a common one now, is actually started from Puma 1985, and it went through different evolution process coming to Zeiss Robotic Surgical System, which was heavily used by American Army, and then moving on to Da Vinci as we know today. So I'll come to now more focus on Da Vinci surgical system that how this robotic system works and how it has implication for us in our gynecology. Now we all know that we are pretty good at abdominal surgery. Either uh, it's a transverse incision, but it may be up and down incision as well. If it's a large fibroid uterus, mm -hmm. then we will have up and down incision. And from there, we are very good at vaginal surgery. And from there, we all came towards laparoscopic surgery. Laparoscopic surgery is still the holy grail of most common operation done in gynecology uh, and numbers are obviously increasing continuously. And from there we move into robotic assistic surgery. That's where we are right now. The next thing is definitely coming. Um, and I think it's a matter of time, literally, maybe a year maximum when a single port robotic surgery will become common. As uh, they had single port laparoscopic surgery, but that did not become common because hand-eye coordination was very challenging and it didn't do the work. But when we put the mechanized fingers inside the abdomen, then it takes away that kind of hand-eye coordination and dexterity thing then I think the, the, the single port robotic assisted will become the next future for us, which I think Intuitive is working and, and soon they will be getting a license as well as maximum as next year. And that's possibly we are moving. So there's a huge evolution chain. That is ex exactly the first line I said that as a humans, we always challenge ourselves. What's that we can do better? So from large, big incisions, we're moving towards small, small incisions. And we'll come to benefits, even though we, we know them very well, but this is again a evolutionary change. Now, what is that thing which we want to deliver by doing this kind of surgeries? Now, um, you will tell me about yourself, how things are in Iraq, but when I see my patients in the clinic here in London, they're all working women. The first question is, when can I go back to work? 
when I can get back to resume activity, when I can go back to gym. They are just in a rush. Number one, two, being working in a hospital, Ali Nakash knows how Chelsea and West Middlesex work, that I have patients today, I'm operating on my patients. I have to have these beds empty for the patients tomorrow. They're under huge stress. We are simply counting every single bed and so we can get the next patient on those beds. So for us, it's simply not possible to have a patient do a hysterectomy and keep the patient for four days or four nights in the hospital. So these pressures are the one which are not translating into us to do something different, maybe something better. So if I look at the outcomes, what should be my principle, whatever technique I use, length of stay, complication, surgical site infections, readmissions, and all these things, conversions are critical key. And from patient perspective, how long they have to stay in the hospital? What is the recovery time? When they can get back to normal? Can they go home on the same day, outpatient versus inpatient? So these are the patients what they prioritize. And all these things, what I like to do as a surgeon, or I like to avoid as a surgeon, and what patient experiences translates into money. Length of stay is linked with cost. Complication linked with cost. Surgical site infection repeated in readmissions linked with cost. Conversion linked with cost as well. So then again, cost becomes a very critical issue. And obviously it comes with then staff, ergonomics, dedicated teams, OR efficiencies, analytics training comes into that as well. But point what I want to make from this list is these are those objectives, no matter what technique we use, either it's a vaginal hysterectomy, day discharge, or it's a laparoscopic hysterectomy or robotic. These are the key fundamentals I'm trying to achieve in that thing. Now, as the robotic surgery, uh, USA actually is kind of a five to seven years, years ahead of uh, UK and Europe in general, I will say. So if you look at the USA, and that's a USA slide actually, that we can see 2008, Da Vinci was actually uh, given a license by FDA in 2005. To, and then we can see the numbers went from 100,000 procedures robotically done in gynecology all the way up to over a quarter of a million. Absolutely huge rise we have, along with obviously general surgery as well. So as they came in the market, gynecologist was one of the first specialties to pick it up as well. And that's where a very interesting um, observation we make. It's a very interesting observation that when we introduced robotic surgery came, then the first thing you will think, oh, now the laparoscopic will convert into robotic surgery. And that, that, that will happen. But actually something strange was happening. Laparoscopic surgery was going up, kept going up, is still going up and down. But, and as the robotic was introduced 2005 and went up, you see what the red thing happened. This is actually a total abdominal hysterectomy. So we saw a huge decline in total abdominal hysterectomy as the robotic surgery picked up. No, it doesn't mean uh, that it's simply because of robotic surgery, it's also other factors. Endometrial ablation came into market. So we have a global endometrial ablative method, which means we do not doing so many hysterectomies as we used to do before. Uh, you try an artery embolization, other treatments came <laughs> from my parents, So we did not need to operate on them as much. There are many factors, but Da Vinci, our robotic surgery was one of the factors. Why it was one of the factors? Because if it was a large fibroid uterus, I thought, oh, laparoscopically it will be difficult. Can I just put it on an open list or send it to my colleague who does the open surgery? Now robotic surgery allows me, and I will show you some videos as well, hopefully, that, that allows me to even have a 24 week uterus uh, for, uh, stuck me to be done robotically. Or you can have so many fibroids up to 28 weeks and multiple fibroids and you can do them robotically. So robotics actually not only replacing the laparoscopic surgery in a different way, but actually it's the open surgery where they're they making a huge difference. And, 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 the, and obviously the benefits are clear, which I will come to you in a minute. Now, what is that robotic? What does that mean, Da Vinci system? I'm sure all of you are possibly have seen or have been into theaters or have done it yourself. That's the kind of a setup we have in our hospital. It has three parts to it. There's a one surgical cord. This surgical cord has two small clips in my hands, which control 
all these instruments, which will be a bipolar, monopolar, KDR, some kind of graspers. Then in the feet, you have monopolar diathermy, bipolar diathermy, a small button where you can make your camera close and further away. And there's another clip which changes the instrument. If you want to change your instrument from instrument number three or four, you change them. So this is a surgical console. Now, one thing is, is, is absolutely important. I think that's what changes, that's what made me very attracted, is this 3D vision. And this world immersive, and I mean immersive, mean immersive, that changes me. Uh, immersive, uh, what I understood, what I understood now better, that as you're operating, looking into this console, you're almost feeling you're sitting in the pelvis physically, and you're trying to do this tiny, tiny, small, small vasculature. And that just changes it because your hands now are not fixed sticks as we do in laparoscopic surgery, rather inside hands are like my hand, which can move to almost 90 degree and can go up to 360 degree. And these extreme movements ability of these virtuality allows me then with that vision of 3D to be much better. And I think that that's absolutely game changing thing when you come to operate. Um, and again, precision and hand movements that change everything. And so we have uh, uh, instruments hand next to patient, and then you have this controlling tower here. This actually is the one which is a brain of this one, which changes the image uh, into a 3D uh, for you to transmit it back here. And that's the one also which is controlling the instruments as well. All these three things are connected to each other by fiber optic cables. And that's the kind of a setup they have. We have no vision, 3D, precision. And precision is a key. Now, I would like to think about myself that I'm a good surgeon or I'm an acceptable surgeon. Now, good surgeon mean I still know that after one and a half hour of surgery, I will have a small bit of shake in my hand, no matter how good I am on the laparoscopic equipment. When you give this small shake to a machine, then machine takes it away to almost 0, 0.00. There is no shaking. Machine doesn't shake. My hand can shake. And that precision brings you to a level where I can do my urethralysis. I can do my nerve sparing surgery. I can work very close to internal eyelid, external eyelid without causing any harm. And that changes the way we can work. And obviously, uh, you will hear about, uh, uh, for example, lymphadenectomy and endometrial cancer with the robots is, is absolutely amazing. And then control where it gives you. And all these things, the vision, the precision, the control gives you shorter hospital stay, less operative trauma, quicker recovery, less pain. And that's the way I've seen in my practice as well. Now, we can ask you that, uh, why you need it? You are doing already laparoscopic surgery. You're doing all sorts of operations. Why do you need to spend so much money on a robotic surgery? But it's a very valid question, actually. And that question, we always have to think in our own uh, health system, whichever health system we are. Um, for example, I go to Pakistan uh, for courses. I don't tell them to buy a robot next day. I want them them to have a good laparoscopic kit to start with, learn very well, everybody's doing laparoscopic, then maybe a day will come when they can have a robotic as well. So if you think about myself, we are a big center, we are doing complex endometriosis, TLH, lab mammectomy, we're doing lots of this kind of operation. But then there was a challenge, even for me. And that challenge was, when I'm doing a hysterectomy, if it's a large uterus, I would say, uh, just send it to Mr. Nakash. He will do the big uh, extract me because I, I, I will be doing something else then. Or morbid obesity, that's another challenge. When it came to endometriosis, if I have to do ureteric anastomosis and I've caused a ureteric injury, or we have to take it out of the endometriosis and re anastomose it, again, our urology surgeon may not be a good laparoscopic surgeon, so we have to open the case. Um, uh, though we can do it ourselves, but that's always an issue, but that's another thing. Myomectomy, if the large fibroids, posterior fibroids, multiple suturing, cavity suturing, is challenging when it's laparoscopically. So even though we were doing laparoscopically, we knew our limitations, we knew our limits, that that's the limit, I cannot do more than that. And then last thing which nobody talks, and it's a hush-hush, what about the surgeon who is operating? They get tired, there's an element of fatigue, the focus goes off when you're operating for two and a half hours on a major case. Not everything is a ectopic pregnancy or a small dermoid cyst or a small endometrioma. On any endometriosis complex case can take three and a half hours or a big hysterectomy for that matter. Postural changes, standing all the time with your shoulder up, trying to do it, can have a fatigue on your shoulder. And that's what we do not think. We do not think as a surgeon that yes, 10 years ago, I did not have something. I have something now, so why should I use it? Uh, so not to use it at the expense of a surgeon. Obviously, cost comes into it, but I'm keeping the cost out of it. 
I want to look at my time as well. My time is almost over. Ten minutes more, Akash. I think ten minutes. Yes, more. yes, yes. You are doing well. Okay, uh, okay, that's fine. That's fine. So, well. so here I will take you a few of the clinical. So that up till here, I've just painted that picture. That why robotics? Why robotics in gynecology? Where is the place? Now I want to take you through some of the clinical most common scenarios in gynecology. Let's think about hysterectomy. Now there is a huge evidence now that if you do hysterectomy in a robotic way versus open surgery, total abdominal hysterectomy, is to reduce complication, reduce length of stay, reduce blood loss, reduce transfusion, reduce readmission rates. That's absolutely given. Traditional laparoscopic surgery, which we do, is again better in all those things as well. Obviously, every procedure has its complication, has its learning curve, no doubt about it. And robotic surgery has its own learning curve as well. But that's the interesting thing. The robotic system learning curve is shorter than the laparoscopic surgery. Laparoscopic surgery is much more uh, tough, difficult, hand-eye coordination, 2D vision, dexterity. There are so many limiting factor, limiting factor with our instruments. So even though we are good, it takes us time to be, get to that level where we can say, okay, I'm doing an advanced surgery now. With the robotics, however, that learning curve is, is smaller. And we all can see that. I, I give an example. For example, last week, we did a course for laparoscopic suturing. That course, we had trainees from ST4, which means fourth year of their registrar, all the way to seventh year of registrar when they're about to become a consultant. We started the course in the morning and it was four o'clock when we did the assessment. I was happy with nine out of 10 that they can all switch it now. One still was struggling and nine of them were good, but they have to keep practicing it to be better and better at it. But they were good, they understood how to do laparoscopic switching. I can promise you, and, and I'm sure one of some of you have noticed it as well. On a robotic switching, if I put you on that one, it will take you maximum two hours and when you will get out, you will be absolutely the master of robotic switching. And you know what's more interesting? You don't have to be a doctor. I can pick up anybody from the street. I can bring them on a robot. I can say, look, sit there and with their hands, because the hand movements and the instrument tip movements are just natural. As I'm putting fingers with my fingers, I rotate my thread up and down. Same thing you can do it and you'll be fine. So it is so simple. And I think that's definitely, uh, I mean, I'm a little bit extreme, I will say. Uh, a time will come, maybe in 20 years time, people will say there is an open surgery, a vaginal surgery, and there is a robotic surgery. During this time, 20, 30 years, we never had robots. So people used to stand up, had sticks in their hand, and they used to, oh, they used to struggle with sticks and this and that. A time will come, I think, uh, when, when we talk about that. So let me take you through this little bit of practical scenario. This case, we did about, um, I think, four weeks ago. She came in, she had a uterus up to umbilicus. My ports are above the umbilicus in this case now. Uh, and, and then and then we are seeing, it's, it's quite, quite a, I'll just go quick, quick now because I don't think we have so much time. Um, so the key I'm trying to say is, and please look at the instruments, the way they're turning at 90 degree, that there is no, uh, this instrument can just take any shape. I don't have to worry about the large uterus coming all the way to the umbilicus, about one kilogram in size. I do not need to worry. My camera can go zoom all the way to the ovaries now and can work right in the area where I need to be. And the visuals and 3D allows you to just to be safe at that time. And these instruments, uh, just, just keep watching and I'll just keep going forward as well, a little bit quicker. Uh, the, this patient had a, not only a large fibroid uterus, but also two cesarean sections as well. And you all do open surgery or possibly some of the laparoscopic surgery, you know how challenging they can be, massive blood vessel coming. I want to show you something here, two things here, the bleeding I will show you and how robotic surgery helps you. So this scissor is turning 90 degree on itself. That's a huge twist of this scissor now. So my left hand is doing the bipolar diathermy Scissor is monopolar. So we are, uterine pedicles are being coagulated. We think it's enough. Monopolar needle goes in and cuts it. Now just watch. We go in and blood vessel comes in. And your instrument is just ready next to it to just do a diathermy. And my camera is so closely focused. So here again, that element that your assistant, or oh, do this, do this, move the, no, that thing is gone now. Camera is in my control. So you control the camera. It's something bled. 
instruments are there and you and you bring in third instrument now. This third instrument was parked on the side in case I need it now. Because there's a bleeding, I need more control. Third instrument comes in now and my scissor is not working. And you come in, you get your uterine nice, actually we are above the uterine. So we're in actually pedicle, we're still doing it now. And, and you go in and, and, and you do it. So again, just showing you that how these instruments can be twisted, turned in this very difficult, complex case where uterus is almost the size of coming all the way to the umbilicus now. And, and then again, just stick with the principles. Same thing what we do open principles of surgery, technique of surgery remains the same as open surgery. Nothing changes on that end. You, you are applying the same knowledge to this robotic thing. Only thing is, this patient now can go home within 24 hours and, uh, and with a minimal blood loss and very precise surgery as well. I'll just go a little bit forward as well. I don't think we have so much time. So here we go. It's a lot of adhesion she had as well, obviously because of previous section. But again, uh, I'm not bothered about all the uterus coming all the way to umbilicus. My camera can zoom all the way to the, uh, to, to the bladder and we are just dissecting it. I'll go a little bit forward. Here we go, all the adhesions. We'll keep moving forward. So again, they're here. This, trying to show you as an example that how this thing is done again the other side of the ovary same principle you coagulate it well and then tiny tiny small small snips uh, and then you work toward the umbilicus i'll go a little bit forward as well here again so we just in a big cases i put a we don't put swab in every case but some big cases good to have swabs in and that's actually hysterectomy is done now so we are just simply uh switching the here is subtotal hysterectomy we mosulated the fibroid uterus in a bag so i'll just go forward we're cleaning it here because all done that's the plastic bag we put it in this plastic bag quite a large bag actually you can put a large mass inside this bag and that can be safely mosulated out without any contamination in the abdomen the bags techniques are still fiddly but we are getting better and using them that's the one we're putting the bag in it and once the um, the the fibroid uterus is in the bag then we close the bag completely and the mosulator goes into the bag and we take the whole uh, fibroid out so i'll just come out quickly now from here and just show you a, another different thing as well. When it comes to myomectomy, the challenge again for us as a gynecologist is if there are multiple, many fibroids or large fibroids, we will not do laparoscopic, we'll go towards open surgery and we still do that. Patient selection is the key and pre-operative assessment and pre-operative selection is absolutely the key. Uh, but again, uh, once if I'm going for myomectomy, large one, would I always do an MRI scan to make sure the fibroids, number one, are of benign nature as much as we can check. And secondly, what the exact position is so I can approach them. Uh, in terms of benefit, we absolutely know the benefits that robotic surgery has far more benefits as compared to open or laparoscopic approach. And I just want to show you a straightforward fibroid, a six centimeter intramural fibroid. Some of you, if doing laparoscopic myomectomy, they'll be doing the same thing. Injection vasopressin goes in. I always inject my fibroid with vasopressin. It's a good practice to do. It reduces the bleeding. And then again, in this case now, robots, robots are already docked in. So my assistant just pushes the needle in. And with my arm, I can just focus the needle where the fibroid needs to go. We can go a little bit further away forward here we go same thing what you would do laparoscopically or maybe open as well you just create a little bit of coagulation a safe space uh, there's a tenaculum in my hand you can see tenaculum in this hand tenaculum is now fixed and monopolar needle and then you have a bipolar you can just simply go and you dissect it and this dissection this is one of the amazing thing will be of robots they've changed the way we do myomectomy surgery this tenaculum what you see working now it can simply grab the fibroid pull it up and with your two hands now, you can simply dissect any size of fibroid. It is as simple as it is. Uh, and just, I've selected this fibroid to show you how, and it's very hemostatic surgery. Um, and obviously uh, with the keyhole, these patients can go home within 24 hours as well. I will just keep forwarding it as well. Uh, here we go, just keep, and then you can see now, absolutely under vision and 3D allows you to have a very good view as well. This is allowing us now to go for bigger and bigger fibroid um, uh, robotically because switching is so easy as well. That's the next thing. And switching the cavity is so easy as well. That you simply take the needle and we run V-lock, which I'm sure some of you will be aware of it. V-lock is a stitch. You don't need to give any knots anymore. You just simply run it through. I'll go forward just to save time. So we go forward and I'll just, and that's the one fibroid is out. I'll just give you one more example, endometriosis excision. Again, we know. You have 
three more minutes. It's okay, three. that's fine. I am sorry to say that. I would love to you to stay for another 50 minutes. But... No, wait, no, no. <laughs> we will be three minutes done. So again, yeah. the intimate decision. Uh, I just realized after the one that this is again just showing you how you can do the surgery with the endometriosis excision. This patient has a deep endometriosis, that's the ureter, and then you can do ureterolysis in a very, very specific way. I will just go forward and um, uh, just, so again, uh, purpose of showing this videos was that how we are applying it. These are different comparisons have come up now, systematic reviews, meta-analysis confirming that robotic surgery is proving to be beneficial. So really the leap into the future before I finish my one, two minutes possibly left now, we are going towards more and more towards virtual reality. That will be a fact. When I can put goggles and my patient can put goggles in Karbala and Najaf, and we will be sitting in one room in front of each other and we'll be talking to each other. I may not be able to examine her or see her, but there are many specialties who will be just doing that virtual reality. This robotic surgery allows you now that patients could be in, in, in theaters in Najaf and I'll be operating from London while the surgeon in Najaf will also be sitting next to patient in case there's a complication. The way the future is going, I think these things are moving very fast and very quickly, quickly toward that side. So take home message will be, and finishing it quickly now, number one, Da Vinci or robotic surgery. There are many systems, by the way. Da Vinci is a market name. There's a CRM, there are Hugo, there are so many systems. It's a immersive technology with extreme levels of dexterity, almost as better as our hands. Number two, 3D visuals give the best anatomical detail more than the naked eye, hence helping with the finest synergies during the operation. And by the way, easy to learn as computer laparoscopic. Don't tell anybody, because that's the secret. It's very easy to learn. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for your time. Thank you, Amma, for this lovely talk. Really, really. Now I can see why you look young, because you're having fun every day. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. That's true. I knew that one. You're having fun every day. Well, that's a very lovely presentation. I be. I want to be one of the robotic surgeon tomorrow. <laughs> that's it. Come and join us. I come to you. Thank you very much. You blessed us with your knowledge and your lovely style. Really, really appreciate it. Really appreciate it. So now we come into the next speaker. Next speaker is Dr. Rabi Hanakariakos. Uh, he's uh, he qualified from uh, uh, a Nahrain College in of Medicine in 1999. He completed his residency in obstetrics and gynecology uh, between 2004 to 2008, and he is one of those young Iraqi clever chap who managed to get to the state as well. So he trained in Michigan and earned his American board certification, in fact, in his specialty in 2010. This was uh, followed by intense fellowship training in gynecological oncology at the University of Carolina between 2008 to 2011 and earned his American board in 2011, making him having two boards, the Iraqi, the, these two board certification. He's an expert in minimal invasive surgery and robotic surgery. So he, he's having fun. Um, just like I'm every day, I'm so jealous, you know. <laughs> With one, he got so many awards of teaching surgical skills and has trained many senior staff, residents, and followers. He's also a certified executive coach for which he earned his certification in his matter in December 21. He followed this certification because of his passion in improving the lives of physicians. I think, I know you got a colleague in Iraq. You got this gentleman. He is Rabi Hanakriyakos. Rabi, the platform for you now. Thank you so much. as alaikum. Uh, it, it, it is an honor to be invited. Um, I'll jump into my uh, presentation. And uh, Dr. Raza, I loved your presentation. It's amazing. It's kind of a segue to talk about some uh, surgical techniques. And basically, so let me just kind of pull up my presentation here. Um, one of the one of the most important things. I'm oh, sorry. One of the most important things when we talk about uh, surgical uh, surgery and gynecology, we always con we have to concentrate on the knowledge, knowledge of the anatomy. And as Dr. Riza uh, talked about, the surgery is the same. Uh, basically, the surgery itself is the same, whereas 
the uh, the technique might be a little bit different, but the same surgical principles apply. So now when we talk about surgical anatomy of the pelvis, and I tell all my trainees and all my colleagues that this is our playground, we have to understand what structures are, where they are, and what lies behind the structures. So in teaching surgical um, residents and attendings, we always talk about in the pelvis, we have structures that we should not touch, uh, but not allowing to touch them does not uh, tell us that we don't have to know where they are. So when we open a pelvis, either um, laparoscopically or uh, laparotomy, the main structures, frankly speaking, are sitting behind our organs that are, that are in appearance. So we say that we have to make sure that we know which structures we have to avoid. And we divide those structures into dualities and singularities. The dualities, as we all know, are the ureters, which are the most important uh, organs to avoid injury in, in, addition to our, in addition to our vessels. So, and if we were to do any deeper dissection, another level of dissection, and especially in, radica in radical surgeries, such as radical hysterectomies, or even deep-seated endometriosis, we would really want to know the additional blood vessels that are beyond the level of our uterine artery levels, um, and even our uh, pelvic innervation to minimize the complications that are related to uh, bladder dysfunction and um, defecation dysfunction. So in the best gynecologic surgeon is the surgeon who is uh, very knowledgeable about the pelvic spaces, because especially if we are performing deep-seated endometriosis or cancer surgery, knowledge of the retroperitoneal spaces gives us the advantage of acknowledging the organs that we should protect in addition to management of any complication. Hence, we can control our own problems uh, by such knowledge. So, and as we all know, the, all the pelvic spaces that we use in our dissection um, are basically potential spaces, meaning that God created them without any space in them. But if we perform the appropriate surgical dissection, that will allow us, um, that will allow us to identify which plane we are in. And if the plane is, if we're on the correct plane, then the dissection and the control of any complication would be very easy. And one additional thing that we also talk about uh, mastering retroperitoneal dissection is there are many times when we cannot find the organ that we are protecting, and, specific, and namely the ureter. So a lot of times when the ureter is either deeply involved by endometriosis and or adhesions and or malignancy, the best way to find this is retroperitoneal dissection, either in the pelvis or above the pelvic brim. So when we talk about our uh, dual pelvic spaces, we talk about pararectal spaces. Um, can you guys see my pointer? Yes. Okay. Yes, yes we cool. see it very clearly. Absolutely. Yes, so, it's very clear. Thank you. Perfect. Yeah, so we have our pararectal spaces, uh, which is the most important space to identify the ureter. We have the paravesical spaces, which we more or less divert into the medial paravesical space and the lateral paravesical space, which contains the obturator nerve. And that's where uh, this space is not mostly uh, uh, entered by gynecologists, unless if you have deep-seated endometriosis. And then we have our singular spaces being the um, the cul-de-sac or the pre-rectal pre and the retrorectal or the presacral space. And then we, of course, we have our um, retropubic space. Uh, if we're going to do any bladder dissection for the sake of um, doing a boar flap or a soas hitch, just like Dr. Reza mentioned, if, we're, if we are going to be operating on our own ureteric um, quote unquote complications, knowledge of how to operate on the bladder is going to be essential. For the presentation, I had planned to show some videos, but I'm going to skip those videos just to talk about uh, some 
uh, basics of preparing the patient for, for surgery. And the reason why I'm concentrating on surgical techniques is now that I'm in Iraq, I'm being involved in training some of my colleagues in uh, laparoscopic surgery. Um, and I'm hoping to get to gain more traction in, in assisting in uh, increasing their um, expertise. And mashallah, I have someone who is doing great in that, mashallah. So one of the things we we'll talk about is uh, what is the most important part of uh, any safe surgery is being preparing is preparing the patient for the right surgical technique, of course. And as we all know, uh, Trendelenburg is going to be a very, very important aspect in laparoscopic surgery. And just to kind of uh, segue here, we are in Warith uh, Cancer Institute in Karbala. We are going to introduce the first robotic system, inshallah, in Iraq, and we're going to involve our colleagues in training. So, inshallah, down the road, when we have more of these episodes, we will show some of our achievements, inshallah. So, in regards to patient positioning, we always talk about making sure that the patient does not slide. Now, in America, we were privileged to have a lot much more resources. So having a special sponge that would sit under the patient or a special uh, instrument to prevent from sliding. And then the second most important thing is having the arms tucked in military position and that way, this prevents any uh, arm complications, specifically compartment syndrome, which I have witnessed with a colleague because the arm was not situated in the right way for a significantly long surgical procedure. And now one thing, and I, I bet you that uh, you all would agree with me, is uh, identifying our limitations in, in these procedures uh, from a time perspective to minimize to minimize patient complications. So one of the statements that I give to my trainees is, I say, if your laparoscopic or robotic technique is taking you more than twice the time that it takes you to do an abdominal hysterectomy, then I would highly consider um, revising the surgical technique or having somebody else with you in that case, because the longer you spend, uh, the higher the risk of complications you would have. Um, in the sequence of event is also something that I've been very strict about in regards to uh, standardizing the technique. So patient, uh, placing the patient on an anti-slide foam or on the bed and securing their positioning. And then um, I always advise my surgical staff to have a sheet of uh, under, the, under the patient uh, on top of the um, bed. So that would allow us to uh, tuck the arms and then put the patient in supine position, of course, establish the anesthesia, and then I always tell them to place an oral gastric tube to minimize the gastric uh, inflation because of uh, uh, pre-intubation uh, um, aeration. And then at that point, and before uh, put it, putting the patient's arms to her side, I move the patient's buttocks a little bit hanging over the end of the bed and not a lot to, to avoid any sciatic nerve injury. And then uh, set, setting the patient in lithotomy position at this point of time um, uh, and making sure that the thigh abduction and flexion should be parallel to the floor with some flexion and pointing the thighs towards the shoulders. And that would minimize the uh, potential uh, nerve complications that could happen just because of positioning. Always make sure that the elbows and the hands are padded with foam to minimize any uh, compression injuries is very essential. And then, of course, at that point, securing the arms to the side in military position. And there has to be a clear communication, of course, during this procedure uh, with the anesthesia staff. And I can tell you one of the challenges that we're having now here in Iraq when I'm doing these cases is the anesthesiologist is not used is not used to having the arms away from them. So I establish an uh, a venous access that is good for them and we start, we continue our communication and thank God that they've been very, very helpful in this matter. Another thing that we were um, privileged in America is to have shoulder blocks to minimize the chance of having the patient slide down this has this, in, from my experience, 
um, and doing over about more than 2,000 robotic surgeries was very essential for our very morbidly obese patients. We're talking about BMIs of 52 and above. But here, I, I don't have these, uh, and we, haven't, we have not needed them yet. Testing Trendelenburg is going to be essential prior to patient, uh, placing the position, the patient in that position, especially in docking the robotic system, because if the patient slides when they're on the robotic system, uh, it's, it's, it could be a potential disaster. But here uh, we're doing laparoscopic surgeries. So we're always in communication with the anesthesia staff to acknowledge if there is any shifting of the patient position. Scrubbing the abdomen and vagina afterwards and putting the Foley uh, under sterile condition and uterine manipulators. Uh, so far from my experience here in Iraq, they're not the ones that I, used, I was used to in, uh, in, uh, in America, but I have my own vaginal fornices identifier. And this is where I'm teaching that you don't really have to have a uterine manipulator to have a successful robotics, uh, successful minimal invasive surgery. All you need to make sure is that you have a good identification of the vaginal fornices. So you could um, make sure that the ureter is far away from the uh, uterine vessels when you coagulate the uterine vessels. And I have my, my own device that I'm using for that. Now, abdominal entry, even the sequence of events here, I do it while the patient is in supine position. I do it without my assistant when I lift up the fascia so I can acknowledge where the fascia is when I'm inserting my varus needle. My personal preference is always to enter the left upper quadrant at Palmer's point. That was in my during my robotic uh, uh, cases because I use that same point as an assistant port. Here I've modified my technique just to go super umbilical using the uh, varus granted that there has not been significant abdominal surgery. But if I have a midline incision, then uh, I, I will go through the Palmar's point. Um, of course, we do the confirming the entry with various needle and doing the saline test to establish the peritoneum afterwards, and then placing the trocars um, after that, uh, placing the trocars and then uh, before that, I'm sorry, I put the patient in trendelenburg position, especially if they have a, a morbidly obese uh, uh, abdominal wall that might sh shift my trocar placement. Now, trocar entry, uh, and we'll talk about this a little bit that I've been teaching this here is, uh, most people use the diamond shape. I modified my approach to using one-sided uh, operation, uh, and I'll, I'll point to that uh, shortly. Now, so most people use the diamond shape configuration where the surgeon is either standing on the right or left side, and one hand is close to him, well, one port is close to him, and the other one is very far away from him. I've modified that approach where if I am a right-sided handed surgeon, I put both trocars to the left of the umbilicus and operate on the uterus from one side. And then I have an assistant on the left side with one entry only. Um, and that has been very successful, uh, granted that the assistant understands what they're doing here. Teaching entry is very, very essential in how to, in minimizing um, uh, vascular injuries. Uh, so teaching how to, how to enter with the patient in supine position as compared to uh, entering with the patient in lactate position, whereas there is a much larger chance of injuring the base of the aorta. So with the uterine manipulator, um, we all know it's, it's helpful to man maneuver the uterus intraoperatively, but again, I concentrate on having a vaginal fornices identifier, and we all know that once, if we push the uh, manipulator or the identifier inwards, that pushes the ureter laterally, allowing us to safely coagulate the uterine arteries. Now, of course, 
with any surgical technique, the surgeon has the obligation to understand the potential complications and how to manage those. So from a surgical technique perspective, we always say uh, understanding uh, dissection, retroperitoneal spaces and which organs to respect is very important. But then also, should we, should we have any complications? Um, anticipating the complication is in my mind, half of the journey to minimizing the complications. So if we're doing any trocar injury, if we're going left upper quadrant, we have to understand that it is the safest place, granted that there, it has not been a site of any surgical operative procedures. So in, from my experience, if I've had any prior gastric bypass surgeries, ruin-wise or splenectomies, that site becomes very, very high risk of having any complications because of the adhesions that could pull up the transverse colon or even the descending colon at the palmar entry site. Um, having, uh, when we're inserting any uh, trocar, so we have to understand our va uh, blood vessels and the vasculatures. And if we're entering anywhere in the area where we've had prior adhesions, even that uh, uh, could cause complications and even operating and understanding that if we've had a patient with prior pelvic surgery, the ureter itself could divert its course and become closer to our operative field should we have any prior endometriosis and or pelvic surgery and or even cesarean sections. And that's why it is very, very essential to take all the measurements in minimizing that complication, starting by a retroperitoneal dissection where you identify the course of the ureter and then taking the standardized surgical steps after that. So in general, we, we classify our injuries um, as into vascular injuries, and most of them are direct mechanical, mechanical injuries. And I can tell you, um, growing up in America during my residency and fellowship, and, where, and when laparoscopic surgery was taking its course, and people were doing more and more of it, we were seeing many more, many injuries uh, merely because of the fact of not understanding the pelvic anatomy and or the trajectory of inserting any ports. Uh, GI, uh, GI tract injuries, those happen more, um, other also mechanically in the, the presence of adhesions or not respecting uh, when we insert the trocar. And then we've seen a lot of thermal injuries being either direct thermal injuries during lysis of adhesions or having uh, indirect thermal injuries because of cop uh, copulation, um, because of faulty laparoscopic instruments. Urinary injuries, we've had a huge share in our uh, practices back in America, and I've even heard of some here. And this is where, again, managing those uh, in a manner that uh, is preventative to start with understanding the anatomy and taking all the uh, measurements necessary to minimize those. But I can tell you, I have personally had my own share, fair share of thermal injuries, especially during um, uh, type three radical hysterectomies. And uh, those have, have made me respect the tissue much more in, in the earlier stages of my career where now we've even gone back to how much radical is truly needed during radical surgery and are we doing a good service for our cervical cancer patients. Port site hernias, I've had maybe a handful of my, uh, during my cases, and I can tell you that in my training, my, my mentors would not uh, close any port 12 millimeters or less. But after one port site hernia in the umbilicus, I, it has been my practice, anything more than eight millimeters has to be closed with a, with a fascial suture or a deep seated uh, figure of eight. The nerve injuries are the most annoying ones because the majority of them can be prevented by appropriate um, placement of uh, positioning of the patient and uh, acknowledging their their presence afterwards is very important. And from watching 
or sitting on many uh, morbidity and mortality conferences back in America, I can tell you the majority of these nerve injuries would occur because of prolonged surgical procedures where the, the, the surgeon became fatigued in uh, doing the surgical procedure and then it just became a vicious cycle of negativity where um, prolonged surgeries uh, led to more nerve injuries. Um, I don't want to go into detailed uh, uh, explanation of all the nerve injuries, um, but how much more time do I have, Dr. Ani? Uh, you have another seven minutes. Seven minutes. Okay. So um, I'm going to donate that seven minutes to other people so we can leave some time for discussion if that's okay with you guys. Yeah. Really, that's very nice of you. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, because I don't want to go into details that we can read somewhere else. I'd love, I'd love to hear from others and then have some, a longer Q&A. That's very nice of you, Dr. Rabia. Very nice, lovely presentation, and thank you for your generosity. And, uh, well, if you stop sharing now so we can, I hand over the uh, microphone to the President, Mohammed Sudani, to present our last speaker. Uh, Prof Ali, I want to thank you very much. This is uh, turned to be a wonderful meeting. Uh, although I'm a urologist, but I learned a lot today and a few uh, tips from my colleagues, uh, gynecologists, particularly about uh, urethrocity. I quite agree Yorita, with Urethra is our friend, you know. <laughs> uh, I know that. I, I, I have actually worked with our uh, colleague, the gynecologist in the hospital, on uh, many occasions either helping them in, in difficult cases or repairing some, some, some problems. I quite agree with uh, Dr. Rabi, if you try or if you want to uh, avoid injuries, particularly to the ureters, the best thing is to explore them, to identify the ureter, see the ureter, and that's the only way that you uh, protect the ureter from injuries, particularly if you have a difficult case. Most of the injuries to the ureter is lack of knowledge of the anatomy, or there is a problem particularly with cancer and, 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 and the gynecologists get a bleeding during the dissection, and that's where things go wrong. Other uh, things which I found, the uh, ureters end up being caught with the stitches when, um, uh, when closing the vagina, and again, when there is some endometriosis or abnormal tissues there. Um, so this, the, most of the time, uh, happens with, 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 with gynecologists if they are not identified the urgent properly. And yeah, we move to the next speaker. And it happens, uh, Prof. Farid is my classmate. Uh, we spent six years in Baghdad Medical School studying Medicine, what a wonderful six years. Uh, nobody would, would forget uh, any moment of these six, six years. We had a wonderful time, very happy time, a great time, I would say. Farid uh, went to the US to, uh, to continue his training, uh, and I came to the UK, and both uh, we ended up uh, each in his place for various reasons you all know. Uh, Farid uh, specialized now, uh, was special, wanted for training in uh, obstetric and gynecology, and he is a professor of obstetric and gynecology and the uh, Women Clinic uh, and Mercy Medical Center, North Dakota. Uh, Farid uh, is well trained in everything and he performs everything, and I think he's also certified laparoscopic as well as uh, robotic surgeon. The subject he will talk about today, uh, it's again very interesting to me, is the ovarian uh, tumors. I have uh, uh, treated complications of ovarian tumors, uh, those related to uh, urethral obstruction or final stage, they come to us at the end. So Farid, please, uh, it's to you. Thank you very much. Let me see if I can share. Okay.
I'm trying to, to find a way that I can share. We can see your presentation. See it, we see it. We can see the first page. Oh, okay. All right. Okay, you can see it now. Great, wonderful. Uh, let me see if I can, okay. Uh, uh, thank you, Mohammed. I appreciate uh, appreciate your, uh, the introduction. Uh, the topic is an ovarian cancer uh, review and a, uh, and a future outlook. I'm going to try touch here and and there. First of all, in in accordance with the university uh, protocol, I have to declare I have no financial interest in any of uh, whatever I am going to uh, presenting. Uh, and I would like really to thank my, uh, to thank my uh, uh, my research assistant who helped me in uh, in, in producing and research and researching this. Uh, when I was when I was in the military service uh, way back, I was fortunate enough to spend the majority of my military service in the Taiji Hospital. That has allowed me to, to get a job in the old private samurai hospital, if some of you remember that. And uh, samurai hospital is, uh, uh, you know, that allowed me to, to work closely with uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Faisal Sudani, Kamal Samurai, Qais Kuba, and all those, uh, what I call at that time the giant in, in gynecology and in obstetrics and gynecology. So that really spared my entrance in, in gynecology. One case I remember there is a patient who came in, I think in her mid 40. She came in with what is obviously an increased bloating and increased abdominal girth and Dr. Sudani operated on her. He made a small incision and he drained her ascites and took a biopsy. And that's all what he did as far as a treatment. And he did not proceed with any farther. Basically said, this is an advanced case and it is not gonna be benefit from therapy. And that's really lingered in my, in my brain and have me kind of, research more of this. So what's the, the epidemiology, uh, epidemiology of, uh, uh, we can start with epidemiology. According to the World Health Organization, there is a 315 or 314,000 case of ovarian cancer worldwide. That's provided that everybody everywhere is reported case. My hunch is it's probably more than that. Um, and ovarian cancer is the, is the third most common gynecologic cancer after cervical and endometrial cancer. But um, in the United States, uh, we have approximately 19,000 880 cases at 12,000 is related uh, to ovarian cancer. And, but it is the most lethal cancer, GYN uh, cancer. Uh, okay. Here's uh, this is a picture of the ovary. The ovary is a very interested organ, and and it have a multi uh, cellular. We got cervix epithelium, stroma, which is produce serious and mucinous endometroid and clear cell and transitional cell carcinoma. We have a germ cell, which is called called this germinoma yolk cell embryonal carcinoma and choriocarcinoma and teratoma. And we have the sex core uh, malignancy, which is called granulosa cells, thicoma, fibroma. Some of the startoli cells, some of these produce androgen hormone, some of them produce estrogen hormone. My talk is today is gonna be specifically to the epithelial uh, 
cancer because it is the most common cancer. Okay. I, I, let me just touch on the risk factor for, uh, for ovarian uh, cancer. Old age, advanced, advanced age, it is a very, uh, it's a, essentially is a risk, uh, uh, risk factor for ovarian carcinoma. As uh, the incidence of uh, epithelial ovarian cancer increase with increasing age. Uh, some research health, uh, health national health study shows that increased risk approximately 2% for every additional age, uh, uh, additional uh, year of age below the age of 50 and 11% after the age of, uh, uh, of uh, 50. And the most, the medium age where is ovarian cancer is 63, but it's... The patient younger than 20 year of age is the most common cancer is usually is the germ cell cancers. And patient and typically occur in patient in their 30s and 40s. Once you get into their 50s and 60s, uh, then you have more than epithelial ovarian cancer. That does not mean uh, that if you are young does not uh, does not have an epithelial ovarian cancer. I actually six uh, eight weeks ago I operated on a woman who have uh, uh, epithelial ovarian cancer. He's her age, she's thirty eight years old and she is meliparous. Uh, the average age for people who are Lynch syndrome, which uh, it's 43 to 49. So the people who have Lynch syndrome is tend to, to develop or if they, if they develop ovarian cancer at a young age. People who have BRCA1 and BRCA2 carrier, usually they have it between 50s and 59. The BRCA1 is a, young, a younger age. There's, uh, there's theories that early menarche uh, and late menopause could increase the risk of ovar uh, epithelial ovarian cancer. And this is related to the fact that prolonged ovulation, prolonged period of time where people have ovulation, ovulation is uh, cause trauma to the epithelium. And that is the same principle where people who are using fertility drug like Clomid uh, or uh, and other medication, they are at higher, at uh, increase somehow increase risk for of uh, for ovarian cancer. Genetic the genetic factor I touched on. Um, It, it checked, uh, touched on uh, Lynch syndrome and I touched on the BRCA1 and BRCA2. Uh, Nelliparity, uh, endometriosis, as asbestosis, pelvic radiation. And, and this is an estimated cancer is associate, uh, of ovarian cancer associated with BRCA1 and BRCA2. And you can see here uh, related to ovarian cancer, uh, the, and the increased incidence uh, with the, those. Unlikely or controversial risk factors, uh, menopausal hormone therapy, obesity, polycystic ovarian syndrome, intrauterine devices, family history of breast cancer, talc, powder. As a matter of fact, we have a, a case here is uh, went through the tort system is people just uh, uh, have malpractice for, uh, 
for you uh, against manufacturer of dark cigarettes, smoking, diet, exercise. So these these are uh, unlikely, but an implicated factor. Let me touch about screening for ovarian. Screening for ovarian cancer first start with family history. That is very important is to identify the high risk from the low risk and the potential for consumer. Because if you identify it from history, somebody is at higher risk, then the screening, the process of screening is different from the process of screening of somebody who have at lower risk. In the av or in the averages, in the average risk women, there is no evidence to support benefit for ovarian cancer screening. There is no screening strategy have been shown to reduce mortality. And screening strategy are associated with a high risk of false positive and it cre create anxiety and it creates uh, some harm to the patient. So the first process is identifying who is at high risk, who is at an average risk, and you take it from there. To reduce ovarian mortality, screening the screening program and need to detect ovarian cancer in, early, in the early stage. That is really a key factor. Diagnosing ovarian cancer is in, 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 in its early stage, stage one, stage two, improve survivability and improve cure tremendously. So screening is have to be able to to diagnose cancer in the early stage early detection with imaging focus only on on ovary may miss many tumor if some some people advocating screening by doing either ultrasound transvaginal ultrasound and i'm going to come into that or other imaging they will really miss a lot of it because ovarian cancer is multifocal and there is a lot of time you have what we call a small, a small ovary ovarian cancer where the ovary is usually a normal small size, but it's have, uh, its patients have uh, an advanced case of ovarian cancer. Most experts feel screening program for ovarian cancer should have a positive a predictive value of at least 10%. If you have a positive predictive value of 10%, then you will have uh, uh, at least 10% require specificity of at least 99.6%. Now, we are in gynecology kind of spoiled by pap smear. Pap smear, it's a very excellent screen for, uh, uh, for uh, cervical cancer. And it's actually shift the paradigm is now is the majority of cervical cancer is treated at the pre-invasive or in, uh, stage. And we're always looking for a screen for other gynecologic uh, uh, malignancy similar to that, but we haven't found yet. We haven't found yet uh, a test similar to that. So we really don't have a very good test screen for ovarian cancer. Patient with abnormal result is if, you know, with, with false positive could create really a high anxiety, could subject the patient to unnecessary procedure or surgery or diagnostic uncertainty. Now, CA125 has been around for a long time, and I'm going to talk about a little bit more of that. Annual CA125 test, uh, CA testing is lacks is, uh, sufficient specificity for screening for the average risk patient, and it is not a good tool for screening. The CA125 and ovarian cancer tumor marker did not, does not reduce mortality due to ovarian cancer when, when studied in a specific screen. A study shows CA125 may predict ovarian cancer, but it is usefulness is 
hampered by limited specificity and low uh, positive predictive value. Annual, uh, uh, some people advocating annual CA uh, 125 testing, it, it's really have, it's have no value. It's have it's no sufficient uh, predictability in screening. The change in the CA 125 level over time may be more informative in approach and generally in, in, a in a treating and following ovarian cancer rather than in screening. Let me... Is, uh, that's why, this is why CA-125 is not a very good screening tool by itself for ovarian cancer. CA-125 is elevated in a variety of benign gynecologic condition, and, and, uh, and it is listed here, adenomyosis, uh, benign ovarian uh, neoplasia, endometriosis, fibroid, uh, ovarian hyperstimulation, pelvic inflammatory disease. As a matter of fact, that you know, so it's so these these are some of the benign gynecologic uh, which is have elevated CA one point five. Is also there is a non gynecologic condition could could have elevated CA one twenty five. Transvaginal ultrasound. Uh, Quite a number of people, and there is a lot of published study is uh, advocating using transvaginal ultrasound as a part of screening for ovarian cancer. The sensitivity of transvaginal ultrasound is uh, is from eighty to hundred percent. They show women clinically is is not as specific to, and it is not does not improve early diagnosis for, ov for ovarian cancer. There is, there is some research is now is in studying ultrasound and uh, in combination with the CA-125, but that <clears throat> really in management of adnexal mass rather than in the screening for an ovarian cancer. Other tumor marker other than uh, CA125 uh, CA is, uh, is available is uh, uh, human epididymis uh, for it to have a high, to have higher sensitivity than CA125, but it is, again, it is more um, helpful in following people who are already diagnosed with cancer as following treatment and following recurrence rather than uh, rather than in, in, in a screening. CA when CEA is non-specific, uh, it may be more helpful in the screening of uh, colon cancer, but it is really not helpful in uh, in the screening uh, ovarian cancer. Clinical presentation. The uh, ovarian cancer can be presented in acute presentation. Patient is presented with ascites, pleural effusion, or bowel obstruction. Usually, these are advanced cases of ovarian, of, uh, ovarian cancer, and usually these are stage three or stage four. And, 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 and this can be presented either into the emergency room or presented in your clinic. The subacute is a um, uh, presentation. A patient is presented with um, pelvic abdominal pain, bloating, gastrointestinal syndrome. It is not relieved by simple measure and it is persistent. Um, and that's what make uh, uh, diagnosing of ovarian cancer uh, early and challenging is that in the early stage of it is a presentation, it is non-specific. Most of the sy symptom is non-specific. Patient come and said, I have bloating, I have a little bit tenderness, I don't feel, you know, 
uh, my belly is getting a little bit, uh, uh, and it is most of it are non-specific. And again, pelvic and abdominal symptom, it is listed here, pelvic and um, vaginal bleeding, a very rare presentation of uh, ovarian cancer. It's most like, it's uh, more like uh, endometrial cancer rather, uh, rather than ovarian cancer. Uh, rare representation, yeah, lymphadenopathy, rectal bleeding, parent, uh, neoplastic syndrome, incid uh, incidental finding, adnexal mass, atypical uh, granular cell of uh, on uh, cervical cytology. These are, these are a consensus of uh, uh, a statement about symptom of ovarian cancer. Again, you have to be aware of these things, as, especially if, if it is these symptom is does not get relieved or get not resolved with, an, with, the, with a simple measure or with the uh, appropriate measure. Uh, diagnosis. The diagnosis of uh, of uh, epithelial uh, ovarian cancer is a histo histologic diagnosis. It is based upon pathology evaluation of tissue following surgical removal of the ovary or the fallopian tube or biopsy of the peritoneum is, again, that goes to the core that we cannot diagnose ovarian epithelial ovarian cancer based on elevated CA125 or based on an abnormal imaging by CAT scan or, or uh, transvag transvaginal ultrasound. The staging and treatment. The basically the treatment of ovarian cancer have not changed a whole lot in the last. Uh, I've been practicing uh, for over thirty years. Have not really changed that much. It's improved, but uh, basically it goes by reduction and destruction. Reducing, reducing the uh, the load, the tumor load, and try to de destroy the remaining part of the tumor by either by uh, with with chemotherapy. Uh, surgical uh, cyto reduction. It is very uh, and and chemotherapy is the hallmark of the ovarian uh, of. Uh, of the uh, ovarian cancer treatment. The epithelial ovarian is surgically and, patholo and pathologically staged. You know, it's, uh, we have the, the staging is done during the surgery and during the surgical process. Here is, a, it's a rather a busy slide. This is the, the TNM and the FIGO staging of the uh, of uh, ovarian cancers. Uh, you can find it in any in, in any textbook, and it's basically when you do when you do uh, your surgery and you go through the process of staging it uh, step by step. Uh, and in an accurate staging and appropriate staging is very important for the treatment and very important to predicting the, the survival uh, of, uh, 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 of the patient. Uh, Dr. Farid, you have three more minutes only. Okay, I'm sorry. Well, here's a, a three, uh, uh, the surgery for, you know, we just heard from our colleague about uh, robotic surgery for uh, gynecology. It is very well, maybe the robotic surgery is very well uh, emphasized now in endometrial carcinoma, but 
the labrotomy is the hallmark of, of, the, of the treatment, of the surgical treatment for uh, ovarian carcinoma. Midline, midline incision, it is still the standard uh, uh, procedure. Sometime if accidentally you have a fantasy incision, you can convert those to Maillard or a Cherny incision, but the midline incision will allow you to inspect all the, all the organ and to allow you to reduce the to, to, to debulking of the tumor is adequately in. Now, as far as... Uh, you know, the open laparotomy versus minimally invasive sur uh, surgery, as it's the rare open laparotomy is the standard. Minimally invasive surgery is have a very limited role in, the, in, ovarian, in ovarian cancer. And it's a probably could use maybe on to obtain a tissue diagnosis to confirm uh, through laparoscopy. Other than that, there is no uh, there is no role for minimal in invasive surgery in uh, robot. The same thing is with the uh, with the uh, robotic surgery. I'm just going to try to go through it. Removing uh, all the mass, you try when you're debulking of. Uh, uh, Ovarian surgery, you try to reduce the mass and you remove the lymph node as much as as much as you could. This is a schematic of uh, of the lymph node. Now, you occasionally you go and you will see a unilateral uh, ovarian cancer. You should, when you dissect the lymph node, you should dissect the lymph node bilaterally. You should not limit it your uh, yourself to the to the side of the of the tumor. I want to uh, skip to some since I don't really have the time. Uh, here is a, a good uh, slide about the five year survival in the United States from two thousand seven two thousand thirteen. Uh, Stage one, 89 to 90%, they survive for five years. Stage two, 71%. Stage three is 41%. And the stage four is 20% uh, or, or less. Prognosis, I, you know, since I don't have really time, let me, because I want to touch on something is important is uh, the opportunistic salpingectomy for fallop uh, for fallopian tube and peritoneal tract. There is enough and ample evidence is now is that is said that ovarian cancer, which is epithelial ovarian cancer, it's a rise in the fallopian tube in the distal part of the fallopian tubes and it is deposited on the ovary and is deposited on the peritoneum. Uh, uh, peritoneum. So there is now a, what we call opportunistic salpingectomy for people who are at higher risk, you, people who have Lynch disease, people who have BRCA1, we have BRCA2, if they finish with their, with their childbearing age, then we probably, we will advise them to have a salpingectomy. Now, people who finish with their, with, uh, with their childbearing uh, career and they want to have a tubal ligation, I, we do recommend nowadays to have a total salpingectomy, rather a simple ligation of the tube to reduce, uh, uh, to reduce the incidence and the risk of, uh, of ovarian cancer. Thank, thank you very much, Dr. Fer. Okay, okay, all right. Thank you, uh, very lovely, informative uh, presentation. Uh, now, I, I know Dr. Majid now with us. Uh, Dr. Majid, can you have the platform just to say a welcome uh, words for the crowd, really, please? Dr. Majid, are you here? 
so probably he's not here. Um, now we're coming to the last bit of the webinar. Well, uh, very well done for all the speakers, really. You, you've been all fantastic. And, uh, and the Q&A session, I don't see many questions there as far as the chat tells me. However, I can start off the question myself. And uh, when anybody who needs a question, please just raise your hands and Islam would pick it up. There is one oh, question in the chat group. Okay, what, what, what is that, Islam? Yeah, please take it up. So the question is from uh, Dr. Rabi Hanna. Um, there is a huge hype here in Iraq about HIPEC, and I've been counseling patients that it should be considered investigational of the current scientific evidence we have. Any comment? This is to Dr. Uh, Farid. Um. There, there, there is some studies here in the United States about it. Uh, uh, there is a commercial, uh, it's commercialized and they try to, uh, they, they try to push it. But it's really like what I said, it is still investigational and it is still have not proved that it is can diagnose ovarian cancer at an, at an early stage that is will make a survive meaningful um, or diagnosing cancer in the uh, in an early stage it make make a difference in the survival and of the patient all right um there is a couple of um Hans Rizin. Um The first is um, Dr. El Sam, if you can. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the excellent lecture. I myself, as a histopathologist, I work with surgeons closely because we make the diagnosis. Just want to comment a couple of things. First of all, you mentioned the cervical screening um, uh, as uh, you know, something that is easier. Of course, for many reasons, it's more accessible and it's easy to be done because it can be done by GPs, nurses, and so on. So it's a very cheap test and it's reliable. So that, that's one thing. You mentioned the uh, staging of the ovarian cancer as uh, mainly by surgery, but I would like to mention the importance of imaging because imaging ha has improved significantly over the last couple of years where staging can actually be done and um, before uh, patients undergo surgery, as well as diagnosis, because from the images, uh, radiologists have become very good in picking up uh, abnormalities as indicating most likely malignant against benign. I've got one puzzle which always puzzles me all the time as a pathologist. I deal with both sides, testicular tumors and ovarian. In general, Ovarian teratomas are benign. In general, testicular teratomas are malignant. And I consider that as one of the um, natural cases of discrimination, sex discrimination between the two, because you've got gonads, and a gonad in the woman with teratoma is benign. The gonad in male, although we know that uh, other tumors of the ovary are malignant, in particular the epithelial tumors. I haven't got a, a, a reason for that, do you? Uh, I, I, is, I have no, uh, maybe Mohammed can share this thing about the male, uh, male testicular tumor. But you are right, you are absolutely right. It's most of teratoma in female are, are benign and it is what we call mature uh, teratoma. But occasionally, uh, we excise it and we think it is behind and uh, you guys pathologists come back and said there is some uh, uh, a weird thing I, I, I noticed in my career one time it's reported to me that there is a, a okay. cancer of the of the thyroid thyroid tissue uh, carcinoma. Uh, yeah, and teratoma of course hey. yeah. 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 yeah so I you know I had hey, uh, many yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hey. Hey. Uh, so can you in, in, uh, anybody who is not asking anything can they mute themselves please 
Yeah, I just, I just muted them. Uh, Islam, carry on, dear. We have two raised hands. We have Manal, we have Ali Kupa. So don't get uh, it's my turn. It's my turn. Yeah, to put the question. Salam, salam, beat me. Salam, beat me for to my question. Uh, he mentioned the testicular tumor first. And Farid, well, first, thank you very much for this wonderful uh, presentation. And so the other speakers, really first class uh, presentation. Um, my question, uh, Farid, you spoke about the epithelial. Uh, ovarian tumors, and it looks uh, prognosis, particularly stage three and four, quite poor, five-year survival, 40 and 20%. Uh, if we look at the testicular tumors, as uh, Salam said, we mainly deal with germ cell tumors, and prognosis has been transformed. Uh, they are very good now. Uh, even stage three, we could get prognosis is 10 years survival of up to 90%. So why is the ovarian cancer so um, uh, difficult to treat in? Uh, ovarian cancer, it's usually difficult to, to diagnose early because number one, like I said, we do not have a good screening method for, for it. Number two, the symptoms are non-specific, and it is usually people ignore it. Um, there is one slide um, I, I, I just want to uh, share with you, uh, maybe about the, the future of screening. Uh, I don't know if you all can see it or not. Very, very volunteer to give this talk well. It's <laughs> okay. Yeah. Did, did, do you see this slide though? And I, you, oh, know? Okay, no, you have to share it first. You have to okay. share it. You have okay. to share it, then you can I'll, share it. Okay, well, I, I, I'm trying. I'll, I'll try. Anyhow, uh, screening is it's, it's really hopeful in the future, is because. Uh, uh, fi you know, mapping the human genome is very important in uh, uh, in a humankind development. Now, the other thing in the process of the screening, as our artificial intelligence is uh, improving more and more, screening is going to be like basically when you can go to the bathroom in the morning and when you go do your pee or your pee in or whatever you do, uh, your smart bathroom is going to tell you that, you know, you got something is going on in, uh, in your lung or in your prostate, you need to check it. So that is really the future, in my judgment, of screening. There is some, it is genetic screening, abnormality in the gene, what is make trigger these cells to divide uh, to divide uh, not logically. And that is where it is. And that's not only for ovarian cancer, that is for all cancer if you if you can uh, you can find it. Okay, uh, let but us I, let, I, let Ali Kuba let, let Ali Kuba comes, please. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Ali. I think Manal was ahead. Maybe Manal should go and I will follow. Yeah, okay, no, gentlemen. Ladies, <laughs> ladies first. Ladies first. So go ahead, Manal. Where, where is Manal? Manal? Shufla? Yeah, yeah. She's there. She's there. Thank you. He's, very a, much. he's a gentleman. He's a gentleman. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, first of all, my first question was for Victor Farid. I want to share with him. Uh, I have a case I um, did for her uh, a hysterectomy because uh, she uh, has her main complaint. She is a virgin, and her main complaint was uh, just a dull ache on her lower abdomen. Uh, all her uh, ultrasound have uh, they said she has uh, only a simple cyst. When I did a bimanual, a bimanual examination, I couldn't do it for her because she was a virgin lady. Abdominal examination, she has a lower abdominal gardening and stem dullness, and uh, I suspect there is uh, an abnormality because the uterus was fixed. Then uh, her ultrasound and uh, 
advanced uh, ultrasound I did for her, they said they ha she has a mass, maybe it is a bedinculated fibroid, or it is an ovary and tumor or something else they didn't know because they see the ovary and they see the, the uterus at the same time and mass in between. So uh, we did a laparotomy, it was an explorative laparotomy, and it was an, uh, and, and I did for her before that, CI125, it was not elevated, uh, it is just was a little bit elevated. Um, so when I did the laparotomy for her, I, it was a um, fallibian tu uh, tube uh, tumor. So this was, a, it is a very rare case. And the patient, after surgery, I did for her, uh, um, they informed me when she was uh, uh, on follow-up by an, an oncologist, uh, it, she had a very bad metastasis. Um, okay. I just want to to increase my knowledge about that. Uh, if the patient have a fallopian tu tube tumor, what was the best uh, management for this patient? Okay. And uh, uh, what, what is wrong? I did for with with her. If if it is that let, certainly uh, was not. Let me, ask, let me ask you a question. What is the pathology? What is the uh, the final pathology? Is it uh, pathology? If it's Epithelial. Okay. First of all, you have to stage her. You have to complete her uh, therapy. That means you have to take her back to the OR and you have to open her up and you have to do an omentectomy. Don't do omental biopsy. Do complete omentectomy. Do multiple biopsy from the gutter of the uh, of the abdomen and from the dome of the of the diaphragm. Even if you don't feel any tumor, just take biopsy, because the most important thing is um, staging her. Now, if she is end up to be unilateral and the stage one and nothing else, then there is a room. And it is still controversial, but it is still, there is a room right now to be treated conservatively for her and to be watched very closely. Once she finished with her family and she done as far as childbearing, you need to go back and complete her therapy and remove her other ovary and, and, uh, and her uterus. But you, for your first step you need to do, either yourself or with an association of general surgeon, you have to go ahead and complete her staging. You have to stage her. Uh, the omentum was negative, and even uh, the lymph node. Uh, we did the staging for her. The, it was uh, negative, uh, omentum, okay. uh, and she had no ascites even. Uh, if her, okay, if her, if her staging complete, and this is what we call the stage one, grade one, uh, and she's a young woman, there is a studies, multiple study. As a matter of fact, I have experience with a few of them. Is uh, One time I have a college student in the same situation like you are. Uh, so what do you need to do? You need to follow her very closely but maybe CA1, although CA1.5 was not elevated, but you need to follow her, follow her with ultrasound and follow her very closely. And there is a room for a conservative treatment or expectant management for stage one, grade one. Until but, but she finishes, until sorry, she finishes. Sorry, but after I did for her a hysterectomy, she come, after hysterectomy, she have a metastasis to the liver. Even yeah. after, after a few weeks. Okay, then stage this four. is a very strange case. Then she then she's a stage four. Then is uh you know it, the pathologist then, said it is only a stage one. No, that was very really, uh, surprising to me. If it is if it is in the liver is a stage four. Well, just uh, may I say so just something, uh, Farid, because this is we see also with the bladder cancer is localized by the cancer and then after treatment they end up with metastasis somewhere else very surprising so with the kidneys but have you biopsy the liver lesion 
No, no, I didn't biopsy the liver. No, I, you I need the biopsy. Liver. You need yeah. the biopsy. You need the biopsy of the liver lesion to confirm yeah. this is from the ovary or something else. Has the liver been? Have you had a CT scan before to compare? To go is, back uh, and compare. No, after no, that's not, no, no. We if you have, we usually do with the tumors. You need a CT scan, chest and abdomen. Unfortunately, they don't do it in Iraq. This should be a standard procedure with all cancer. CT, Absolutely. chest and abdomen with contrast in the beginning. And yep. that will your your basic things. Then you turn back to this. So she need a buy if she, if you haven't got a CT scan to go back and look at it to see if that lesion it's was there or not. Abdomen it said only a localized tumor and it is it's still, maybe no, a that's not it's it's not like that. You could have metastases with localized tumors. Yeah. This is you, can. you can't trust. Cancer you can't trust. Cancer yeah, you, you can, can't yeah. trust. You have to have you have it you have to have a tissue diagnosis. Yeah, you, you have, have to have a biopsy of the, the lesion. Yeah, the histopathologist is sitting there. He said, "You got to send me a specimen. You got, to, you know, you have to, you have to send him a specimen to uh, to make sure that it is not a, a distance metastasis. If it is a metastasis, then a stage four, then she should be treated with uh, chemotherapy." This yes. this could be okay. this could be this could be him in geoma in the liver. It could be any exactly. benign tumor in the liver. Not Ex sure. exactly, exactly, okay. especially. Thank you very much. Thank can you. I, you have control yeah. over things really here. Manal, uh, in summary, the staging was inadequate. The, yeah. Probably she had just MI of the pelvis. Why they didn't? They should MI all of the body. Uh, this is thank you for your uh, question. Now we come to Dr. Ali Kubba for his question. No, I was I was going to butt in uh, uh, Ali, but I'll start first of all by uh, saying it's wonderful to see people from our year. As you know, 1973, Baghdad University Medical School of Baghdad was probably the best year ever. And the fact that we have uh, Farid and we have Muhammad and we have Namir Kosa, and I think we have Ali Bazaz as well. So there are five survivors from the... <laughs> Thank you. We're, 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 plan we're planning very, to be very here very for a while. Very encouraging. Very encouraging. And, very and of course, Thank of course uh, apart from me, everybody looks so young. So uh, well done, uh, the, the year of 73. Now, I was going to raise a few things. First is... Uh, and this is the point that Manal and this discussion that has happened with this rare case, what you need is to have a multidisciplinary team meeting. That is really the way to do it. So, I mean, we, Guides Hospital is, the, is a regional cancer center. So we've got, you know, I deal with cervix, but uh, we've got a very huge ovarian cancer. Every case goes to MDT. So you really need to do that Well, you get the pathologist, the radiologist, the medical oncologist, and then you can plan uh, what you do. So I was wondering to ask uh, uh, Dr. Hanad Rabia whether uh, that is something that is possible. We are in the Iraqi Medical Association. We are trying to promote the idea of MDT, and we're trying to build a model that can be expanded. So in Najaf uh, Rabia, we have a, we've actually ins instigated a very good obstetric um, medical conditions in pregnancy MDT uh, uh, unit, which is working really, really well. And Ali Nakash can tell you a bit more about it. I don't want to have a big discussion because there are a couple of other things I want to see, but maybe you can comment about that later. I think the other thing is, again, transferring uh, skills. Uh, so uh, I was delighted to sort of hear uh, Rabia, talk about uh, uh, laparoscopic uh, minimal access surgery uh, where he is in, in mid-Iraq, but whether that is something that is going to be uh, possible to expand. And again, I think the IMA and the IMU, I'm sure, would be willing to sort of help with that. And I think uh, we have um, uh, um, our colleague from Mosul, if she's still is still there, so maybe we can um, ask her as well. But the third point I wanted to make is I work uh, quite a lot in contraception. And of course, for ovarian cancer, there are two things in contraception which are very important preventative uh, interventions. The first is in the UK, there is a lot of female sterilization as it is also in the US and in 
Scandinavian countries. And we have now moved from using tubal ligation and, and putting a clips on the tubes to essentially do, doing a tubectomy, removing the fallopian uh, tubes. That is a very... Salpingectomy, yes. Yeah, a salpingectomy. So um, that is a really important uh, intervention. The other is obviously, as you know, the combined contraceptive pill has been proven beyond doubt to reduce the risk of both endometrial, ovarian, and actually bowel cancer, large colon cancer. So though with colon cancer is only a 30% reduction and the, the number of cases, uh, the population studies are small, but for ovarian cancer, there is absolutely no doubt. And one of the beautiful things about the combined pill is that if a woman uses it for over a year and stops it, a degree of, pro of protection against ovarian cancer continues up to 30 years. So we tend to say, you know, if someone is 28 and they take the pill to the age of 30, then stop, have a baby, whatever. And obviously lactation and, and, and pregnancy and lactation also is protective because it reduces ovarian activity while the woman is having lactation. I mean, but the point about it is using the pill between 28 and 30 and then stopping, she will continue to have about a 20% reduction risk for 30 years until she's in her late 50s. And that is an important intervention that uh, many women are not aware of and needs to be uh, 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 you know, discussed when someone requests contraception. These were very quick uh, remarks that I want to make. So wonderful uh, uh, talks. Uh, thank you very much for the organizers. Uh, if you permit me, right now, in the, in, the U, in the U.S., as far as sterilization, elective sterilization, we are moving to a total bilateral self-injectomy yep. as, as the preferred method of, uh, of uh, sterilization rather than a simple tubal ligation. I totally agree with you that the birth control pills is have a very protective effect against ovarian cancer or endometrial cancer. Uh, the data for cervical cancer is not there yet, but it uh, you know, uh, but for definitely for ovarian and endometrial cancer. And I agree with you, it is not very widely publicized to the general pop, uh, population. But why, yeah. Farid? Why, Farid? If there is protection with the contraceptive pills, it's so good. Why do you go to self injectomies then? Uh, because most ovarian well, cancer starts in the tube and then Im implants on the ovary. Yeah, yes. More, uh, there is there is more and more data is coming right now that is actually now nowadays is. Uh, the cancer of the of the uh, of the fallopian tube, peritoneal cancer, and uh, an epithelial ovarian cancer is one entity, actually treated the same, classified the same, and the stage the same. And there is a lot of data right now coming out, especially since uh, I'll say it, since uh, uh, 2002 is that the ovarian cancer is a start in the distal part of the fallopian tube rather than in the ovary. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Is, how, could, how could you sell it to, to the patient that you got contraceptive pills which protect them uh, in a good way from ovarian, from endometrial and bowel cancer, and then you go and uh, remove the, the well, tubes and deny them the protection. No, here what, what it is. People who choose what I'm saying for, choose for elective sterilization. In the US, there is quite a number of women, once they finish with their children, they don't want to fool with birth control pills. They want to have a, a you know, either male have vasectomy or they have a tubal ligation. The preferred method is now is bilateral self injectomy in a state of simple tubal ligation. Yep. The other factor, people who are at risk, like people who have Lynch syndrome, people who have BRCA1 and BRCA2, and instead of going to remove both ovary, 
and, and render them postmenopausal and deal with the problem with the postmenopausal of lack of hormone, we recommend for them to have a bilateral salpingectomy yep. rather than bilateral oophorectomy right now. No, it's, it's, it is, uh, Mohammed, it, it is a matter of, public, uh, of uh, essentially educating the public. And because we're into educating the public, this is an advert. Uh, the IMA and the Iraqi Welfare Association are running a, uh, a, a health fair uh, event tomorrow from one to, I think, six o'clock or seven o'clock. And these are sort of messages that we need to discuss, for instance, with young people. Any of you who think that they can go to Wembley, I think Majid uh, Jawad is, is uh, Majid Khatib is with us, and they can give you the details, uh, talking to the Iraqi community uh, here, here in, in London. But I wanted to hear from uh, Rabi uh, about the idea of MDT and about the idea of really building a network of training for minimal access surgery. So I don't know whether you can comment, uh, uh, Rabi. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, your your points were very very well taken. So basically, so I've been here at Warath Cancer Institute, and just to give you a background of this cancer institute, um, it's the first of its kind in Iraq, and we have surgical oncology, medical oncology, radiation oncology, and our experiences is from America, France, uh, Lebanon, Hungary, wherever it is. And we're even, we are going to interview one of our medical oncology Iraqi uh, colleagues from uh, Sweden uh, next month, inshallah. And we have established an MDT uh, platform here where we review any new cancer diagnosis, apply it to the NCCN guidelines or the NICE guidelines uh, according to our resources here. So we have established that. Um, and it's, it's very, very important. One additional factor that we also have as a, um, as a luxury is that uh, I personally review the CT scans with all my patients who get referred to me, and I review them either by myself and or with my radi radiologist who have significant experience in that. So that minimizes a lot of false negative reports that we get from outside. So we're trying to bring the Western um, experience here where a new diagnosis or even a second or third opinion for any cancer care, they have all their care here within one building, all the testing within one building, and we are expanding, alhamdulillah. Dr. you give me an idea. It looks like they're doing a real good job, you know? So why not you? Let's just do a, a webinar on that, you know, to tell yeah. the Iraqis about what's happening in Karbala. Yeah. So what we, Ali, can I just say, I think, uh, uh, we, yes, so there is an exciting opportunity. So maybe Rabi, through Manal, with you, we can have a discussion about these two ideas, oncology, MDTs, and uh, um, in a way, having a platform for, for training. I think... We, we need to talk about it before we set up a webinar, because if we set up a webinar, we need to have the right message to people. And these things are not easy. They're, they're, okay. they're, they take a lot, a lot of work. Yeah. I saw Sorry, a hand of Prof. Munzer will do a long time. Sorry, Prof. Munzer. We, are, we, we made you so late, but carry on, please. Ask your question. Unmute yourself. Unmute yourself, yeah. I want to make a comment for, uh, uh, for you know, the advanced laparoscopy. Uh, I really enjoyed what you know. Now I'm, I'm still doing a traditional laparoscopy. I do very few robotic uh, laparoscopy, but what I use for a technique to enter the abdomen, you mentioned in detail your technique. Uh, I used what we call the visiport technique. Uh, so if I have a, a patient who have a previous adhesion or have surgery, I try to avoid avoid the uh, the varus needle because that's where there's a lot of injury uh, has happened. This is the only blind uh, step of the procedure. I use the the visiport technique, which is I'm sure you're familiar with it. I will use the five trocar tro 
and try uh, and the scope and try to enter the abdomen under direct vision. Our colleague, the surgeon, used the Hassan approach. And a lot of time, if it is really advanced uh, scarring or something, I use the Hassan approach to enter the abdomen. Um, sorry, that is a question. There is a question in the in the chat group um, for Dr. Rabia. Um, is it safe to do laparoscopic surgery for ovarian cancer patient? And what about port side metastases? Yeah, that is a great question. And I've gone heads to heads with a lot of ovarian cancer surgeons back home and back in uh, in the U.S. So at one time we had a GOG three zero zero five where it was involving. I think it was 3005, Dr. Farid, confirm me if I was right, where we had an interval cytoreductive surgery being performed after investigational chemotherapy and biologics. Um, I believe that's what that was the uh, uh, trial. But there are a lot of surgeons in America who are doing uh, robotic uh, uh, ovarian cancer debulking. I personally, I personally do not agree with that approach. I have personally involved doing robotic uh, ovarian cancer surgery only if I suspected an earlier diagnosis. Uh, because uh, if, if I have a CT scan showing an ovarian mass and no evidence of metastasis, then, I, then I'm going to do staging and not a debulking. But once I know I need to do a debulking, I do it laparotomy. So my, that has been my practice and that has what I've been preaching. Uh, to my colleagues back in America and the people who I trained. Now, with that being said, a lot of people have been relying on CT imaging and performing um, uh, robotic debulking, but I always challenge them that the data is not there to support that. So um, port site metastasis, on the other hand, I have seen it both in ovarian cancer and endometrial cancer, uh, and they are not that common. Uh, but what do you think about it? Is an advanced ovarian cancer a cause for port site metastasis? We have the same question to ask about what about the laparotomy incision in ovarian cancer debulking? So there is some talk about the hypoxic state of an, a port site as compared to a large incision is different. So there is that discussion about it. So there is a question. Uh, uh, I'm a traditionalist when I am I train in. Uh, in pelvic uh, fellowship, I'm a traditionalist, uh, uh, although I'm certified in the GYN laparoscopy, but I try to avoid laparoscopy in ovarian cancer, uh, even if it's stage one or stage two. If uh, you have a high incidence of rupturing the capsule when you do, when you do it laparoscopically, and here you are converting a, a stage one a or stage 1B into stage 1C, uh, basically, and, and, and you increase the, the morbidity and you decrease the survivability of this patient. So I'm traditionalist in this report uh, and this, however, as far as endometrial cancer, I'm really pioneering uh, and I've been doing it since for almost uh, 12 years now. Most so of my... Most of my, most so of my need, um, endometrial, endometrial cancer surgery is done ro uh, either robotically or laparoscopically. I don't know what your experience in that regard. Uh, yeah. Islam, I think we already gone beyond the nine o'clock, uh, which is now we are over two hours. But I would like before we, we conclude just to listen to Prof. Mandadui. Prof. Mandadui, do you want to ask any questions? Yeah, of course, he's, he's been waiting to ask a question, Dr. Mundar Duri. If you can unmute yourself, Dr. Mundar. Jawu Al Yasar, I can mute or unmute. Nice. I would like to say be careful with the thin patient with doing laparoscopy because the aorta is that far from the skin. And most of the injuries I have seen with you in thin patient. And yeah. the worst is, the, is using the virus needle and insufflating the, the vena cava. The patient will be dead within a few minutes. 
Absolutely. So, uh, try to avoid uh, vascular injury, and especially in thin patient. This is my advice. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Prof. Uh, I have to make a conclusion to the, this lovely webinar. Thank you, all the speakers, really. You were all fantastic. Uh, thank you for our president. Uh, uh, by the way, Majid, Dr. Majid Jawad, he sent his regards for everybody. He couldn't come today uh, because of his uh, engagement with the uh, exams, membership exam. Uh, I would love to see you, really, all of you next time. Uh, we still planning other stuff to come, but for today, we have to make uh, a bye-bye for you. And inshallah, good night for everybody and have a lovely weekend. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Thank you all. Bye, everyone. Good night. Good night.